it's spring of 2019 and I've just finished my third year of university. I'm quietly starting to not want to watch New Japan but I'm not quite in a place where I'm ready to admit that. But what I am ready for is to expand my wrestling horizons. So I purchased subscriptions to two wrestling services. Odd Japan TV, which meant I fell in love instantly with the god that is Kanto Miyahara. And Stardom World, which would go on to change how I consume wrestling for the next two years. It was Tam Nakano vs Arisa Hoshiki that did it for me. They hit hard and fought with such emotion and passion that I bought in instantly. I had watched previous shows and they were very good, but this was something new. As someone who is used to the New Japan style, this was something fresh and different and it clicked with me almost immediately and I fell in love on the spot. Stardom was my new favourite thing. From there, I watched as much as I could. I even started a podcast with my friend Rob, who's currently writing a book about Stardom's 10th year of operation and you should definitely check it out, his Twitter is below. We talk about Stardom on a fairly regular basis on there. If you've watched to the end of any of my videos, and honestly, why would you? You've seen me plug that podcast. But if you listen to it, or you watch my Itami vs Shiri video, which if you haven't, please watch it. I think it's one of my best videos. I have issues with Stardom right now. A lot of them, and I feel like they're getting worse, and I want to talk about them. Right off the bat, I think it's important to say that I don't hate Stardom. This isn't like New Japan, where I went from loving it to hating it fairly quickly. This is a case of I've went from being fully immersed in Stardom, watching everything the promotion put out, to only wanting to dip in and out for big shows because the full picture does absolutely nothing for me anymore. There's actually a lot to like in Stardom. The roster is incredibly talented, and for the most part, up and down the card, you're normally guaranteed very good hard-hitting matches. I still love watching this roster fight each other. A lot of my match of year list this year will be stardom matches i still like the promotion i just feel myself drifting from its vision i think the biggest marker of when a promotion starts being for you is when what you think is bad is what the fan base thinks is good because obviously the promotion is going to continue to market themselves towards that fan base for example i hate sai kamatani versus tam nakano from yogama dream cinderella i think it's a soulless faux epic with next to no build and wants to be something massive without putting in the effort to be that and this is what it got in cage match. The most common rating is 9 out of 10. That's near perfect. That's match of the year territory for me. Me and the fan base are more divided than ever when it comes to how much we're enjoying big stardom matches. Most notably Shiri vs Utami, which I felt so strongly about and made a whole video on it. If matches like this are what constitutes a good stardom match, or Natsupoi vs Starlight Kid for the high speed title, or Maika and Himika vs Julia and Shiri, if that's what constitutes a good match from Stardom, then I'm not going to enjoy a lot of Stardom matches going forward, am I? But again, I don't hate Stardom. I love, or rather loved, Stardom. I come at this video as a fan of the product. As always, my criticisms are made in good faith. I hope anyone who disagrees with me also criticises me in good faith. Just going to quickly say before we jump into this section, this list won't be comprehensive, but these are some of my main issues with the promotion as it stands. As you've probably gathered if you listen to the Stardom cast, one of my main issues with Stardom right now is the fact that they're not very good at building to their big shows. One of the main points of smaller shows is that they're meant to build up to your big shows, making people want to get into that building. Or for people who don't live in Tokyo, Yokohama or Osaka by the pay-per-view. Which should be fairly easy, Stardom, like New Japan, have split their roster into factions. The logical thing to do here is to pair off these factions into their own feuds. For example, you'd pair off DDM with Queen's Quest for a bunch of little feuds and then on the other side of the roster you have Stars with Oedotai for a bunch of feuds, you get me. Stardom have stopped doing that and it's led to some fairly muddled builds as different feuds fight for the spotlight. For example, let's have a look at the build to the Yokohama Dream Cinderella in Summer pay-per-view. Whose top three matches saw Utami Haishishita defend the red belt against Natsuko Tora, Tam Nakano defend the white belt against Sai Kamatani, and the Donna Del Mondo team of Julia and Shuri defend their tag titles against the Stars team of Koguma and Stardom Ace Mei Iwatani. Let's talk about the build to that tag match first because it's probably the best build on the card. Mayu and Koguma build themselves up as a team, getting some big wins before beating the champions, giving them the right to challenge. Simple and effective, it's not the best build in the world, but honestly, for a match that's third up on the card, it's absolutely adequate. Tam and Saya's build does have an asterisk next to it because Saya missed two shows due to injury. Even in the four shows where she was there, Tam and Saya only faced off against each other once, and each of them only faced off against someone else in the other's faction once each. 
with Saya teaming with Momo Watanabe to take on the Cosmic Angels team with Unagi Sayaka and Mina Shirakawa, and Tam being in a triple threat that includes the Utami Hayashita, which I'm reluctant to count because the Queen's Quest versus Cosmic Angels narrative wasn't even a thing there, it was mostly about the two champions facing off and a bit of Starlight Kid build. This kind of weak build doesn't really need to be a bad thing because it's a fairly simple match to build. Saya won the Cinderella tournament, which gives her the right to challenge Tam for the white belt. It doesn't need much of a build up as long as you don't pretend that it's this big, epic match that's been written in the stars for years. Guess what Stardom did? The pre match promo package played up their very limited history together, trying to make it seem like Tam was this mentor figure when, for the most part, they've been kept apart. And the few times they have shared a ring, it's not been that big of a deal, it's just been Sire and Tam in the ring. In the match, these attempts are big emotional moments don't hit because the history's not there, the build isn't there. Even if Sire was on both those shows, I don't think there's anything they could have done to support the weight of this match. It's a soulless epic for putting absolutely no effort into earning its big dramatic moments. It's a match that needs a lot of build. It's a match that needs a good build. It got neither. Between the moment Tora challenged Utami for the red belt and this pay-per-view, they only shared a ring once. Utami did face a Redditai members and Tora did interfere in the triple threat though. This build wasn't bad, but it never ever felt like the world title match was the main focus during the build. The story with Oedetai mainly centred around Starlight Kid, who was forced to join the faction at the last pay-per-view. Which, if we're being honest, is a story that could have used A more time and B could have been put on the back burner while you're building a title match. It's been a running theme of Utami's reign where the title feels second fiddle to whatever else is going on in Stardom. And it's not Utami's fault, that's just how she's positioned. Adam have been very bad at prioritising stories. It's actually really annoying. Build and everything. Big Adam shows deliver basically every time. The pay per view we're talking about didn't deliver. There were other factors than the build, but the build definitely didn't help. I wasn't hyped for any of these matches going in. Half the time, these builds do nothing but punish me for caring about Stardom enough to watch it closely. The example of a weak build I just gave isn't an isolated incident, builds have been an issue I've had with Stardom all year. On several occasions, thanks to the build, I've been actively less excited about a match. I shouldn't feel that way, it should be more rewarding to watch more of a promotion, but it's not, it's absolutely not. These builds have made me think that the only way I can watch Stardom and enjoy it is only dipping in for big matches. Stardom abuses time limit draws isn't a hot take to most people. It feels a bit weird when a Roti show goes by without one. Draws can be a very effective tool in a booker's toolbox. It can be a great way to bring someone up a level whilst protecting their opponent. Or further a feud about someone eating a loss. And in tournaments, it's a great way to play spoiler for bigger stars. I'm not inherently averse to time limit draws. At the time of writing, two of my working matches of the year in AEW's Brian Danielson vs Kenny Omega and BJW's Takuya Nomura vs Yasufumi Nakanoi ended in battle result. The key difference is most companies understand you should use draws sparingly. Enough of a result to be a possibility, but not make them so frequent that they take away all weight from the results. Stardom has taken all the weight out of time limit draws at this point. When a draw happens in Stardom now, it's no longer some big dramatic moment. It's something like, oh, Uncle Stardom's drunk again. Can someone take the time limits away from them, please? For some people, the draws have just become another result, which, sure, if that's how you see it, honestly, that's valid. But for me, it's at the point where if a draw actually does happen, like in Shiri vs. Utami or in the Five Star, it means nothing. The weight's gone. The bite is taken out of the result. But some brave Stardom fans have tried to justify this trend with maths. In July, this tweet made the round on Joshi Twitter, where some podcaster took some stats, which I'm pretty sure came from my podcast Discord, and put them out into the world with no context. The main point of the tweet is that Stardom has a lower percentage of draws than many other Joshi promotions, and therefore people who complain about the draws are full of shit. This isn't how maths work. Look, I'm no Forrest Sova, I'm not a maths boy, but I know you can't just throw out numbers that support your argument and call it a day. So let's look deeper into this, because honestly when you do that, I think it really puts in context how bad the draws are in Stardom right now. Or at least at the time of the tweet. I've done my own research here, but I'd like to mention that my main reference is a thread by at Jeeva on Twitter. 
I'm so sorry if I butchered that name, but I'm going to leave his Twitter down in the description. This was really helpful. As well as a friend of mine who's asked to remain uncredited, but helped fill me in on the context for a lot of these promotions as they watch way more Joshi than I do. Also to Val who helped push me in the right direction with this, go check out his articles below. First of all, Stardom runs way more shows and matches than most of these promotions. At the time of that tweet being dropped, Stardom had ran 314 matches over 56 shows, 29 of which ended in a draw. The only promotion that's even comparable with Stardom here is Ice Ribbon who ran the same amount of matches over 66 shows. The closest out of that is Wave who ran just over a third of the matches Stardom did in 25 shows. And then the output of Seedling, Marvelous and Sunday Girls is so much less than Stardom that it's absolutely laughable that you'd include them in this comparison. Around 10% of Seedling matches ending in draws translated to around 5 draws at the time. Around 9% of Stardom matches ending in draws at the time means there were 29 draws for Stardom, with almost half of Stardom shows having at least one draw on them. I can't stress enough how disingenuous it is to throw these percentages out there like they're at all comparable. But let's get some context on Ice Ribbon. As I said before, that's the one promotion that runs a comparable number of shows and matches to Stardom, with a comparable number of draws as well. A lot of Ice Ribbon draws were in exhibition matches, which tend to have sub 10 minute time limits, in many cases 3 or 5 minute time limits which my source tells me shouldn't really count towards kayfabe results. They also ran the P-League, which is a round robin tournament with a 10 minute time limit. Draws in a round robin have an inherent purpose, and when you couple that with the short time limit of 10 minutes, it makes complete sense that there's that many draws. When you put it in that context, it's just not the same as world title contender Micah drawing against rookie Mina Shirakawa with no storyline reason or payoff. Because at the end of the day, that's my issue. A lot of these draws in Stardom have no payoff, for the most part they just kind of happen have been and never brought up again. Wave held two round robin tournaments in the first seven months of this year, one of which had a 10 limit time limit, but that's going to greatly inflate their draw numbers. A lot of Marvelous's draws came from working with freelancers like Asuka or their ongoing rivalry with Sendai Girls, who also saw a lot of their draws come from the gays and feud. And from watching Marvelous, I can say that draws like Asuka vs Rin Katakura were made to feel like much bigger deals than half the draws in Stardom. TLDR, these numbers aren't comparable, and when you look deeper, it shows the biggest issue of Sardom's draws. It doesn't take much research to see that a lot of the draws in these other promotions had a purpose or a reason for happening. Sardom abuses these draws for absolutely no payoff, to the point where there could be a decent reason for a draw, like in a championship match, for example Cosmic Angels vs Donald Del Mondo for the artist belts, I feel nothing. Sardom abuses draws so much that it's beyond the joke at this point. The Cinderella tournament was a one night 16 women single elimination tournament where matches were held under a 10 minute time limit and wins occurred by pinfall, submission or over the top rope elimination. I loved the Cinderella, all the factors I just named gave it such a different feel compared to something like the New Japan Cup or All Japan's Royal Road tournament. While you'd rarely see a match of the year on the show, the rule set made for something frantic and fun and you'd have a blast every time. Little narratives would occur throughout the night and as a fan you couldn't help but enjoy that. Even when I wasn't wild about a particular year like 2020 there was still a lot to appreciate and it still felt wholly unique from other tournaments. But this year they made the weird decision to extend the field and hold it over several weeks. I don't understand this. This is baffling for a couple reasons. First of all, we decided to try this experiment at a point where Japan were in and out of states of emergency due to the coronavirus and the upcoming Olympics. This meant a tournament that used to take one night took two months to conclude. Stories and narratives that made perfect sense in a condensed period of time were stretched out to the point of being comical. Did it give us more great matches than in years previous? Sure, there's an argument for that, but it ended up costing the Cinderella its identity. It's a weird decision I've only seen justified as it gives Stardom more dates where we can draw more people. But sure, from Stardom's perspective, I see that as a plus. I don't really care about how much money Stardom makes, especially when it ruins one of the best fixtures of Stardom's year. I mentioned in my Utami and Shiri video about companies collapsing in on themselves as they pursued bigger numbers, it was shit like this I was referring to. There were good matches, sure, but this tournament was a fucking failure, and their willingness to just throw away one of the best parts of their year just annoys and baffles me. Stardom really wants to fuck with longer matches since the Bushi Road purchase. There is nothing inherently wrong with this, but oh my god, they don't seem to understand who they should make go long. Because on several occasions, they have made Mina Shirakawa and Unagi Sayaka go way longer than they should have. Whilst Mina especially is guessing, they have the Tokyo Joshi Pro imports have struggled to put on compelling short matches. Unagi especially has been unbelievably dire to watch at some points. 
But for some reason, the women were involved in a 30-minute draw of Donna Del Mondo, and they went nearly 20 when we challenged for the tag belts. Which is especially egregious because Tam wasn't there to hold their hands. Both these matches absolutely sucked. For some reason in July, Unagi went nearly 20 minutes with Shiri, in a story that could have been at least 5 minutes shorter. Again, going long isn't inherently bad, but Stardom seems to be using it as a sink or swim moment for these fairly green wrestlers. These matches are on smaller shows, but it becomes another moment where I'm punished for watching closely. We seem to be over this hump now, but oh my god, they've been neglecting Tammy as champion at the start of the year. In the first two big shows of the year, she was shunned out of the main event. In the Budokan, it made sense, as Tam and Julia had been feuding for almost a year at that point, and it was easily the hardest feud going into the show. But there was no excuse for shunning B Priestley versus Utami Hayashita from the main event at Yokohama Dream Cinderella in spring. Despite some reservations going in, it was easily the emotional high point of the show. After a really good match, B made good with Queen's Quest before leaving Japan. If the show would have ended with that, I'd come out of it with a much better taste in my mouth than I did. Oh my god, that main event of Himika and Micah vs Julia and Shiri was absolutely fucking awful. I've seen people call it the tag match of the year and like, what the fuck are you on pal? Not just big shows, on smaller road to shows, Utami wouldn't even always be in the main event or semi-main. For the longest time, she felt like an afterthought as champion. And she became that way before she started performing at such a high level that Stardom couldn't ignore it. Not a ton to say about this, but they basically completely dropped Stars vs Cosmic Angels at the start of the year, which was one of the hotter feuds, and I'm still mad about that. I get Mina Shirakawa was injured, but they still had the main players in Tam and Mayu, so I don't get why it was dropped. Also, there was this whole thread about Mike and maybe joining Oeditai, that went nowhere. Also, the random instances of fat shaming Momo Watanabe that never saw a payoff. Also, that weird obsession people had with Mina Shirakawa's boobs. Just, ugh. These were fucking awful and they went nowhere. <laughs> Stardom's fan base contains a lot of creepy men. If this statement makes you angry, please keep that to yourself because it's an observable fact. I'm not saying it's all fans, I'm not saying it's even a majority of fans, but it's a very loud subsection of fans. Wrestling Twitter can be a pit at the best of times, so it's not overly surprising when all women's promotion would attract this kind of fan. I've been having perfectly normal conversations about a match before someone just randomly drops in, yeah she's also hot, into the conversation and that it's just always out of nowhere. It's never natural to the conversation. I've seen these exact fans ask why aren't more women into stardom? This shit. It's not exactly a nice place to be around. I've seen stardom groups sexualize teenage wrestlers and justify it with Japanese law. Stardom have at points lent into this. It's a profitable fan base to lean into. I know it isn't all fans. Please don't bother with the not all fans thing because I know. This is a small but loud section of his fandom, which I don't think we do the best job of policing. People actually sexualize teenagers and we just try and pretend they're on this little island and they're not part of the fandom when they are and we should really just shun them out of it. I don't enjoy talking to strangers about stardom anymore because of this. If it's not Rob or a couple other of my friends, I'm not talking about stardom with people. Or at least I try to avoid it. It's not just for creeps that are annoying to talk to. There's the people who defend a bad decision when it doesn't need defending to the point of making bad faith arguments like we saw earlier with that fucking tweet. Then there's the other side who hate stardom, engage in it anyway, and they're just there going, yeah, fuck stardom, these bushy road cunts. I know it's always been this way, but more recently, stardom discourse has just become exhausting to be a part of. And a lot of times, if I can't talk to someone about something, I do lose interest. <laughs> For over a year and a half, I hosted a Stardom podcast called The Stardom Cast with my friend Rob Goodwin. It caught us both by surprise when we started gaining a small following. People were enjoying and interacting with the podcast. We had a thriving Discord server with a bunch of people who actively wanted to hear our takes on the promotion. This was new to me and cool and was sometimes the one good thing in my life during a couple years where I was really struggling. We did 39 episodes and honestly all of them were fun to record. I love talking to Rob, especially about wrestling, his tastes are just different enough for mine to spark a good debate among us. But one thing people rarely think about with content creation, especially when it comes to smaller hobbyists like what we were, is the grind of making said content. Coding sessions were the easy part. You sit down and chat shit in a structured manner for a couple hours with one of your friends. It's easy and great and enjoyable. But before that, you need to watch everything you plan to talk about, which often meant multiple two-hour shows in one episode. 
sometimes you had to watch it more than once and all this was on a fairly strict deadline for recording days. You then had to take your notes and turn it into articulate criticism that was also entertaining. It's effectively a persona you're putting on. I really enjoy watching wrestling as you can probably tell but this isn't passive viewing. For basically every match I had to not only deconstruct its critical qualities, I also had to think about what it meant for the wider picture of the promotion. And I had to really think about these opinions to make sure they were valid because in a couple days or sometimes in a couple hours I'd be live talking about them. In the last few months when I found myself not enjoying the product that much it really felt like a grind. The process of watching Stardom became homework. More obligation than fun. And I didn't even sink the most time into the podcast. It was Rob who did a lot of the behind the scenes stuff like editing and making thumbnails. I'm not complaining. I really enjoyed my time making the podcast. I love making content about wrestling. If it was a viable career, I'd jump on it in a heartbeat. Like, seriously, what culture? Coctaholic, I'm ready to sell out, baby! I just think it's worth mentioning that despite all the flaws I named here today, I'm seeing stardom from a different perspective. Self-imposed or not, doing this has really burned me out on the promotion. When I see stardom right now, I see nothing but its flaws because I had to dissect every booking decision this company made, and as I've mentioned several times throughout this video, stardom can be punishing to watch closely. The podcast has been done for a month now, but watching stardom still comes with a small amount of stress. Hard to me starts thinking about when the next recording date is because that's how I've watched and consumed stardom for three quarters of my fandom. I've lost the ability to watch stardom for fun. Would I be as burned out on the promotion if I didn't do this podcast? I doubt it but also I doubt I'd have watched this closely for this long. I'd have just quietly watched less of it. For the last few months I can honestly say the main reason I watched at least half the stardom I did was the content. That's not healthy. Honestly how I feel now is fairly inevitable when you think about it. I'm still going to watch big stardom matches and matches I find interesting like I do with most major wrestling companies but I can't be a full-time fan. Not for a while at least. Again, Thank you if you listen to the Stardom cast. Like, from the bottom of my heart, without it, I wouldn't have gotten to know so many cool people and I wouldn't have found the courage to start this YouTube channel. I really hope if you like me and Rob, you follow us in whatever content we make next. I hope you enjoy my videos. I hope you enjoy Rob's book. I hope Stardom stays fun for you. I never had a bad time actually making the podcast. Despite my very small following, I've been asked by a couple of creators for advice on making wrestling content. I always felt honoured that they'd think to ask me, but I never felt qualified to say anything. I do now. If this is a hobby, recognise when it's becoming too much and walk away. Don't force content. This is meant to be fun. Please don't forget that and stop when the enjoyment does. Oh, okay, recording's over. I can honestly say I've never felt more nervous about releasing a video than this one, so if you've watched to the end and you don't hate me, thank you so much. Again, big thank you to all the people who helped fill me in with the context of the other Joshi promotions. I'll link them down below. As well as Rob, if there's one thing I'm going to miss about the Stardom cast, it's talking with him every week. I'm going to leave a link to his Twitter down below where you'll probably be able to find more information on his book. Again, as always, if you want to talk to me, that's at Chrysalis Pure on Twitter. You can also sub here. I guess that's it. Thanks for watching again. I'll see you guys next time.